I guess I don't need to tell you I started the webinar. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> cool. cool. So let's just stop the video just for now. People will be coming in in a minute or two. I'm going to. Uh, <clears throat> more. Okay, so I'm just learning here, Christine, the, the in the chat, on the very bottom, when you open up the chat itself, like when it says two hosts and panelists, mm -hmm. the ellipses beside that is where you can say, you can check the box for everyone. Yeah. So okay. everyone. And then I would say everyone can chat with, I would say, okay, I'm going to put everyone for both. Okay. I don't think I can see that setting though right now because you're hosting, not me. Okay. It's like when I so I guess on only one of us gets one of us gets to host. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. The key there is that you just yeah, let me know. So so now that's on. I'm gonna send out a, a quick tweet. Okay, so I just tweeted that out. I don't know if that's going to drive anything. All right, folks, if you're dropping in, uh, we will be starting momentarily. Welcome to the show. Um, I'm going to share my screen up. So let me just organize. It's interesting how the webinar changes the layout so much in Zoom. Okay. Christine, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, I see it. Perfect. Yeah. All right, folks. So we got a few people already dropped. There's a few more dropping in. I'm going to get started momentarily because we do have a fair bit to rip through. Um, this will be recorded. We'll make it available to everybody who is here, who has signed up, and folks will be able to ask for access later as well. Um, so just quick intro, I am Daryl O'Donnell. I'm the founder of Continuum Loop. Uh, with me is Christine. Christine is one of our consultants who helps also lead our operations side um, and helps uh, keep the tools that we're gonna be showing you in order. I'm gonna primarily lead this uh, session. If you have questions, you can do them in two ways. Preferably if you have a, a structured question you've been thinking about, um, punch it in through the Q&A feature of, of the webinar. Um, we have opened up chat. Uh, Christine will keep an eye on that if it starts getting out of control, meaning we have two webinars running simultaneously. We may shut that down or just ask you to, you know, stop, stop doing that. The reason being normally we love the discussion. We have a ton of content to go through here. This is principally a, which I don't normally do, a, a teaching kind of a thing. So I'm going to run through this uh, relatively quickly. Again, it is available. Christine and I will make the transcript available, the recording available, all of the tools you're going to see here available as well. So you're able to come back to this. This is one of those resources that you may need to come back to a few times, if not many times. All right. So we're going to talk here today about ecosystem launch. What we're going to talk about, I'm going to use these terms and you're going to hear the acronym as well interchangeably. I'm doing that for a particular reason because you need to understand what both are. Um, but there's there's a reason to actually slide into just using the acronyms. I don't normally like them. So we're going to talk about minimum viable ecosystems, MVEs, because they help unlock ecosystems. We're going to talk about ecosystem governance frameworks, an EGF because they unlock a minimal viable ecosystem and therefore unlock the ecosystem. A lot of words there, it'll make more sense in a moment. 
So there's two main drivers for this session. One is Christine and I have been working, one of the major efforts that Christine's been working on at my company is, at our company, is, is releasing the Trust Continuum tooling, which is a very rich tool set, um, releasing as much as we can um, into the open uh, through CC by SA. And this is part of that process. However, it was accelerated a bit by the drop of Catalyst Fund 10. So if you're here for Catalyst Fund 10, you're in the right place. Um, in that we're talking about ecosystems and ecosystem launch. That's the term that's been used by uh, one of our past clients, the Itala Prism team, um, in the challenge that they and others in the, in the decentralized identity space in the Cardano ecosystem put forward for part of Project uh, Catalyst Fund 10. So we're going to cover off this one of the drivers, but really the content here is not specific to Fund 10. We have tailored it to getting an ecosystem going, which is part of the minimal viable ecosystem um, approach. So here's what we're going to cover off. We're going to cover off both tools and how you use the tools. What are the approaches that we use in the house when we're coming into client projects? Um, you, also, why you really need to understand what these two things that I was talking about at the beginning. What is a minimum viable ecosystem? Why is it important? What is that MVE? What is an ecosystem governance framework, an EGF, and why is it important? You'll also, we'll also discuss those tools that you'll have access to that really help you do a couple things. One is understand your ecosystem and help you in designing a minimum viable ecosystem, that MVE. Also helps you create an ecosystem governance framework for that EGF, for that M MVE, and I'm just being a smart ass on the acronym stuff for the win. So I should point out these tools can apply to many different levels of scale. Um, we have applied them to scale where the, the ecosystems are measured in hundreds of millions or larger. We've done them in ecosystems that are the very smallest of ecosystems um, that are really nascent and may never even get that big. They can be used somewhat casually, but they get more and more complex the bigger things get. The key there, so you can apply these tools until you need to bring someone else in and there's other people in the in the sphere that that the, you can help to have bring in to help you understand but for now you should be able to do a lot of this yourself the background behind this is we have a methodology inside our house called the trust continuum um, it's really how we do things when it comes to this ecosystem design ecosystem deployment and ecosystem growth that we get engaged in it really is, um, as I mentioned, it's designed for it's it's it's, head, it's there for our designing ecosystems, deploying them, as well as growing them. Many many different tools. It's a combination of various different methods and frameworks. This diagram here shows the whole bigger piece. Um, there's a couple of mistakes on it I noticed, but uh, it combines. And the big ones you're going to see today are platform design toolkit by a group called Boundaryless. It's a toolkit that we sponsored many years ago. It's really been growing. We're more happy to see where it is. And we've deeply adopted parts of it and tailored it to ecosystem uh, governance framework work that we do. But it also brings in the business model canvas, um, structured ecosystem design, um, a lot of principles and a lot of approaches that are from the Trust Over IP Foundation. We are one of the co-founders. Um, I remain a chair of the tech stack working group over at trust over ip so we're combining all these things business model canvas applies broadly platform design toolkit applies to both platforms but more and more to ecosystems which are different we'll cover that and we're going to cover off the beginning start here this phase one this ecosystem exploration and analysis is really the tools you're going to need to understand how to really launch that ecosystem how do governance frameworks help you in that and how does a minimum viable ecosystem and mve help it really comes from very strange decades of experience. Um, when we look back at the beginnings of, of, of certainly my career and others that we're working with, um, my first startup was in search and rescue. Search and rescue, by definition, is decentralized. There is nobody in charge. They have no resources. They beg, borrow, steal, but they've codified. And I didn't realize back in the 90s, yes, I go do go back that far, um, what that really means uh, and why the decentralized approach to things actually matters. And throughout my career, that has always been decentralized ecosystems is where I have lived. I didn't realize that until, well, fairly recently. So here's what you'll take away. Um, one is you'll have tools, but also you'll have an understanding of what an MVE is, 
what an EGF is, as well as the limited scope of, and I'm combining acronyms here now, the MVE EGF. Minimum Viable Ecosystem Governance Framework. Why is that a limited scope? And those tools that you'll have in hand to help you drive that, as well as an understanding of how these tools play together, because there's interplay between them. And it gets pretty complex. I'm doing that to show you where you can go. You don't have to get complex. When you do, at least you'll have a, an idea of what's going on. So the reason behind this all is that really technology only goes so far. We've seen time and time and time again where technologists kind of throw technology at a problem um, and it doesn't work. But let's cover off what we're not talking about today and what, 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 what your preconceptions may be incorrect. For example, ecosystems, they're not products, nor are they platforms. Platform doesn't necessarily create an ecosystem. There's a lot of platform users on both sides of many marketed platforms, but they're not necessarily an ecosystem, meaning there's no one else playing the roles that you don't want to play. Um, additionally, MVEs, minimum viable ecosystems, are not MVPs. They're not minimum viable products. They're not the same thing. They sound similar and they're a starting point, but that's where, they, that's where the similarities stop. So what's the problem we're solving? You know what your big picture is. If you're in this, especially if you're part of that fun 10 group, again, if you're not, this is just as, just as applicable. You know what the big picture is, kind of this, 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 you're trying to solve a big problem and, and you're building an ecosystem. It seems so simple, but you're realizing you don't know how to attract the partners that are gonna help you build because you can't build it all. If you can build it all, it's a product, it's an app, it's perhaps a platform, but also, one of the reasons you can't attract people is partners can't figure you out. They don't know how they would join your ecosystem. They don't know when you're going to cut their lawn, when you're going to you know, compete with them, where you're going to collaborate with them, where they fit. It, so they don't even know. They may be watching what you're doing and you don't realize that they're not coming in because they don't quite understand where they fit. This is really what we call a cold start situation. You're, you're needing partners to get the ecosystem rolling, but you can't find the partners so that the flywheel hasn't started moving yet. So you really need to jumpstart things. Let's back up to one of the statements I just made that ecosystems are not platforms. One of the reasons is, is when you're in an ecosystem world, you expect, this is especially true, you do not have the control you think you do. Even when you're running a platform or a product, you really don't have the control you think you do. When the ecosystem, it's a humbling moment when you realize you have almost no, if any, control at all. Ecosystems are really about roles and activities. They are about what, who is doing what in the ecosystem. That means, you know, you need to understand, you know, what's encouraged, what's allowed, slightly different there, and also what's forbidden and what are the consequences there? What are the rules? How do I interact? Um, how do players come in? How do those partners come in to fulfill a role and do an activity so that they can participate. How do they fit into this place, this ecosystem, this nebulous thing you're creating with a great vision, but you have to get to the point where, you know, where is it actually, you know, real? Um, apps and perhaps a platform are required. You're definitely going to have to have, especially in this world of decentralized, you're going to have to have applications and platforms doing stuff, but they're not sufficient. Part of what they happens with them is they handle the technical interactions and data movement that are needed in order for this decentralized ecosystem to, to, to operate, but they miss a lot. They miss the key things of liability and indemnity. Those are two that are, if you have a high value ecosystem, you have liability and indemnity. There's value exchange. There's other governance issues there that really come down to how does the ecosystem as a, as a value proposition, how does it create value? How does it generate business? And if you apps and platforms aren't enough to do that. Jumping back, another one I mentioned, MVEs are not MVPs. Minimum viable ecosystem are not minimum viable products. Ecosystem building is fundamentally different. An MVP is really about a few things. It's about getting customer engagement and feedback. It's about exploring the space. So you're trying to find this product market fit thing. It's also about using low cost prototyping to make sure that you're doing that customer engagement and feedback and exploring. An, M an MVE, a minimum viable ecosystem really is about a different thing. It is about actually delivering a value proposition. So you actually do understand big picture, 
what is the value proposition? And MVP, you're still exploring, trying to find out what is the value prop. How do you form the value prop so that it works and drives product market fit? In the MVE side of the world, we're still looking and saying, hey, we have a value prop. We know what's valuable. We know what the proposition is, but we can't do it alone. So we need to attract and align our partners because they are part of that value architecture. The overall value proposition has many stages. If you have partners who are in one or more of those stages, they're actually helping you build and run the whole value proposition. Um, it also helps us know what we are building. If we're building the, if we're the ecosystem driver, the main sort of lead proponent for the ecosystem, we may need to build things and where we need to rely on our partners. And we may, we may end up building things that we do not want to build, but we can't find a partner who understands that that's value for them. So we may spin that out later as part of the a partner is created, who comes in and takes over the parts that we don't necessarily want to or should not run. We're going to see this thing again a little bit in the other presentations it actually gets hammered in, and we're going to share those with you at the end as well. Um, a little more detail on both the MVE and an ecosystem governance framework. Because I want to link these two together. You know, why do we need an ecosystem governance framework? So this minimum viable ecosystem is about, again, delivering the value prop and attracting and aligning partners and knowing where we are building versus where we're using partners. So it's really, really key for us to understand, one, ecosystems are hard. You are bringing in people who may be competitors. You're bringing in people who may you may be breaking their business model, especially when we look at going from centralized to decentralized. You likely are breaking their business model. Um, their overall approach to business is kind of different. Now they're like, okay, hang on, you're changing everything, but also it gets complex really fast. But an ecosystem governance framework really helps your partners see a few things. One is where they fit. So this helps on both attracting and aligning those partners. And aligning is absolutely critical perhaps more important once you've attracted a partner. You have to attract them, <laughs> but if you don't align, you're gonna lose them and you may lose them in a bad, bad way. Because partners wanna see where they fit, where they're adding value and where they're driving their business, where they're capturing some of the value and where the ecosystem is getting is, is, is capturing some of that value, but also where they don't fit. They wanna know where they stop, where they shouldn't go. Um, but also if they don't quite fit right now, they may see opportunities to fit later or to adjust so they can fit almost immediately. So this ecosystem governance framework ties the minimum viable ecosystem together and especially fulfills that role of initially attracting and aligning those partners to build out that value architecture. Another key thing about the MVE is it's about attracting these partners and just proving that the ecosystem works so we can attract and align more partners. We start to spin the flywheel then we start to grow it and spin it faster. A little statement that I make all the time is that there are no surviving complex ecosystems that were designed as complex ecosystems. Every single one of them on the planet that I've never found an exception to this, I would love to find out one of you, if you have one, ping me. Um, they emerged as complex systems from a series of much simpler things. Speaking of complexity, Ecosystem governance frameworks, and this is kind of what they what they look like at a big picture, um, are really complex. If you take a look at, for example, I always use the example of the payment networks, MasterCard, Visa, Amex. You can go into the history of them, and there's a great book we've recommended time and time again called uh, One from Many by D. Hawk. Um, talks about how Visa was established. But if you go and look at what the fundamental IP is, the root intellectual property of those networks, People will say, well, it's transactions per second. That's the decentralized world saying we have more. No, that's a cool thing. That's an aspect of, of what they have. Um, and there's probably a lot of patents, and a lot of cool IP that's driving the ability to have a global network with lots of transactions per second. But above that really is the magic IP that if you took it away, they would collapse. I can replace transactions per seconds in many different ways. But if you take away the IP of their governance frameworks, they're done. There's just no business there. The reason, and if you were to print out those governance frameworks, you would likely fill a large number of large boardrooms with the paper. 
that's behind the rich ecosystems that they have created. They started out relatively simple. They were still very complex, but now they are unbelievably complex, but hugely powerful. So that's kind of a scary thing. We think about just how complex that is. So how do we actually, you know, get this down to something that's a little more reasonable because that's a relatively complex document unto itself. And when you consider how big things get, it gets pretty hairy. The good thing is we have an ecosystem governance framework approach that really reduces the moving parts, really reduces the number of things you'll need down to the key components, the roles and activities that we've talked about, and we'll talk about more, as well as some key artifacts you're going to need. Terms in a glossary, so that you're using consistent words. Um, where and if you're using in the, in, in the identity realm, um, Metalla Prism, Hyperledger Indie, uh, the various check networks, the various different pieces of the decentralized identity world where they're using credentials, you need to have some artifacts as you drive the interoperability that your ecosystem will need, but also assurance levels. We'll talk about that a bit. If you get to assurance levels, you know that there's some real business in this, by the way, but it also gets complex really fast. So let's back up a little bit because that's a lot. Um, we have a lot of these tools I'm going to show you are, are there to help. Um, this small MVE governance framework, the, the ecosystem governance framework for an MVE um, is a lot less to manage than a fully mature one, but there's a lot of pieces. There's a lot of moving parts. So as you're designing it, one of the things you have to keep in mind is every part you add multiplies the complexity. It does not add to it. It multiplies. You go, and I can't remember if that's an exponential or factorial, but you go really ugly really fast every time you add a component in. So the whole goal we go through it feels brutal when we go into the bigger projects um, and spend weeks or months doing this, but the whole goal is to get it reduced down to a relatively simple set, particularly of roles and activities. So where do we start? Going to show you a few of these tools, going to show you how they fit together and tell you a bit of a story on that. Um, this is one of our primary starting point tools, which is called an ecosystem uh, scan canvas. This is where we're looking for what is the ecosystem, and there could be literally hundreds of entities doing the work in this, but we want to understand where they fit. Are they fitting in one of the top, one of these three buckets that run with the lines? One is, um, is it highly fragmented and weird and custom? Um, is it more concentrated? Are we talking more about aggregation patterns? Are there platform plays already at play? Should there be? But also then are stuff more like components and utilities where they're really truly commoditized. We want to understand these pieces because we're going to use them. But again, there's too many pieces here to really consider building an ecosystem governance framework and a minimal viable ecosystem um, around that. It's, it's just too much. We then drop in two more tools and I'll stop showing these tools in just a moment. This is the last two. We do have a ton of them, um, but I want to show you why these ones are important. One is the arena scan. This is where we end up taking a look at, you know, what's our main focus? What happens uh, uh, before something, ha before the ecosystem? What happens after? What has the new capability been enabling or what is enabled by some capability? And more important, I'll show you a diagram on this, is what are those jobs? It says systemic job. What are the jobs to be done? That's a framework that lets you know, hang on a sec, we have some key activities here that might actually play. We then also take, and this is an approach that gets a little hairy, is the ecosystem experiences view. We want to take a look at that ecosystem and cut it up into, okay, what are the actual important parts, the moving parts that we care about? What gets used multiple times? And I'll show you how these kind of link together. We have these uh, ecosystem scan uh, and arena scan. Ecosystems typically have hundreds and hundreds of entities. An arena scan is a smaller area of an ecosystem, which would, be, would have ideally have around tens they link together, but then also we take this experiences and those link together. Um, as I mentioned, the ecosystem, lots and lots of pieces. Arenas have still too many pieces. It's the interactions so we do that, finding these things called jobs to be done, which fits under that arena scan. And we use that to drive, and I'll show you how it comes together in a moment. I've already gotten a little bit advanced here, but I want to show you how this plays. Because we have a huge number of tools. We are going to be sharing these, most of them, those couple that aren't quite ready to be shared um, with you later. Don't get overwhelmed by them because we're going to show you how they tie together. So here's how we use these in the world of uh, uh, gathering more and more information, going deeper and deeper. 
So we take this arena scan and the experiences scan. The arena scan, again, is the smaller chunk of, of entities. The experiences is where we start to see repeating things. Where is a particular component being used in more than one place? We take them together, and that helps us to complete another set of tools. One is a roles and activity worksheet, which, which alludes to the governance framework when we talk about governed roles and governed activities. Not all of them get there, but we want to start gathering them and understanding them. It also starts helping us understand what data types are moving that we need trust around. It's not just data, it's actual, I need trusted data. That starts to give us a hint of what the credentials are that we're gonna need that are at flight in the ecosystem. But also throughout everything we're doing, we're also taking this terms definition because terms are critical. The, 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 the meanings of words will change, but you need to have consistent meaning and consistent terms inside of an ecosystem in order for you to make any forward progress. You will suffer if you don't manage your terms, your glossary. Talk a little bit more as well about the resources and capabilities inside an ecosystem, because this is where you start to understand what you need to build, what you already have and what your partners have and how you leverage them and which ones you should pay more attention to because you're going to want to have a little more control over them or you're going to defer control um, over to a partner because it's simply not your business. We take this ecosystem scan and again that experience, what do we keep seeing happen throughout the ecosystem life cycle? That helps us to complete another couple of tools. Uh, the resources and capabilities worksheet. This is kind of where you, you mentioned in the, in the, we mentioned early in the in ecosystem governance framework, you end up with key components. Not all the resources and capabilities in, in, a, in an ecosystem are relevant. They're important, but they not be relevant for the minimum viable ecosystem to start. Again, we're also gathering that terms. We're making sure we're going to maintain the words and the meanings that we need in the ecosystem. This gets, so how does this all fit together? This is going to get a little bit crazy, but work with me. This is one where you're going to want to, one, print it off. Two, perhaps watch this part again. Um, so the trust continuum is about the three things I've talked about. The first tools are really the arena scan, which is the tens of things, the ecosystem scan on the bottom here, which is we have hundreds of things. And then that experience where we start to see the components being reused in different, different places. And we get an idea. We play with these ones together. We also have this glossary, this terms definition worksheet that we're gathering the terms that we're using throughout the tool. And every tool we have pretty much informs that terms definition worksheet. This is one that on an administrative basis, if there's one thing you're going to do, get your terms right, because that will help your overall ecosystem. You will be consistent, which they can learn. If you're inconsistent, you're just going to confuse and repel as opposed to attract them. We also have that rules and activities worksheet that I mentioned, which starts to feed into things. But what feeds it? Well, the experience canvas and the arena scan all both feed into this rules and activities. It also feeds the glossary. We also have our resources and capabilities worksheet. Um, it is where we're starting to look at, okay, what are the key components to the ecosystem that are, you know, lots of companies are playing in this particular component, this resource, or this capability is provided by 25 companies. This one's only by one. What are they doing? We want to understand that. Those are informed by the roles and activities, the experience canvas and the ecosystem canvas. And when we're working on this, you end up, one, printing off a bunch of stuff, um, two, jumping back and forth. Um, utterly destroying, but it starts to make some sense because you're actually understanding your ecosystem at a much deeper level. So with your initial work, you're looking at what the hell, what was I thinking? But it happens actually relatively quickly. That resource and capabilities obviously informs our, our overall terminology, the glossary that we're going to create later. We have that credentials worksheet, which really starts to talk again about the trusted data interactions, where in the role of X, I'm doing Y, what do I need and what am I producing? And I want to make sure I can trust that data. So we actually start using verifiable credentials for that, as opposed to just passing around uh, unsigned data. Again, that credentials starts capturing terms. This is where we're going to cover off most of. Just want you to be aware there are more tools here. One is a, an analysis that we do of the resources and capabilities, which is called a VRIO, which is we'd look and see something. Is it valuable? If it is, we want to know next, is it rare? And if it's also rare, we want to know, is it hard to imitate? Is it inimitable? And then lastly, we want to understand for our clients, is the organization capable of doing 
and serving this particular need? If the answer is no to any of those, we stop, but we have to understand where in the ecosystem is that coming from? It's a very valuable tool to let you know what, which partners you want to actively work to attract um, and, and where you have gaps in your overall system that you just simply can't do or you may need to do in the beginning, but you want to farm that out, bring someone else who can add even more value, do it faster, cheaper, better, bring them in later. We also have some other tools here. One is the assurance levels. This gets into, again, a high value ecosystem will likely have multiple levels of assurance with meaning and likely liability, indemnity and value, dollars, crypto, whatever the value transfer required to do those higher levels of assurance. Those are informed by the roles and activities of resources and capabilities. As well, obviously glossary, but then we also get into the indemnity and liability behind a bunch of this stuff to say, okay, cool. Is there a serious indemnity and liability problem? I'm not going to get into that today. Another one we use at times, if you're familiar with Wordly Maps, is this is one where we start to derive the long-term ecosystem strategy from that says, hey, listen, as a company, we're working on this particular piece. It's really becoming a commodity. It's not of our interest, but we need to find the commodity players, bring them into the fold, let them take that on because we're not really adding value when it's a commodity. We're more, we're a little higher in the value chain and want to get a little, but that's more of a strategy play down the road. So how does this really work? Because I said, we're covering two things, minimum viable ecosystem and the EGF that drives it. So how does it drive this minimum viable ecosystem governance framework? These are the key things we're looking at. We're looking for the components in an ecosystem, which we've been hinting at. We're talking about the roles and activities. We've been saying that phrase, both roles and activities quite a bit. Particularly, we're looking at the governed roles and governed activities. There's a lot of stuff happening in an ecosystem that you don't need to um, put rigorous controls around. You wanna be careful of what roles and activities you actually want to govern. Because again, the more governed roles, the more governed activities and the more components, the more complex, and I do believe it's exponential, the governance framework gets. So you wanna minimize those, but you don't wanna miss any either. This is where a lot of the analysis comes in. And then we have these governed artifacts. We have a glossary, that's our terms that we've been talking about. The credentials, those are the trusted information exchange components that we're gonna be using as well as those assurance levels, which are really an indicator that we're in a high value ecosystem because it's becoming more and more important that I can trust that particular credential because it's been issued at a higher assurance level. And that's, already, that's a great indicator that says, there's something really valuable here if someone's willing to pay for a higher assurance level because it's now part of their business. How does this all fit? Well, the rules and activities worksheet really is one of the primary informers of, of, the, of the governed roles and governed activities. Kind of makes sense why we call it that thing. Our resources and capabilities worksheet really come into the key components. Not all the resources and not all the capabilities will make it in there, but the key components that, you know, without this ecosystem is kind of um, not gonna work or, or, or will not work consistently and, and therefore can't grow. We also have our terms, as I mentioned, that feeds our glossary. And that's one of the, the simplest things you can do. If you take one thing away, Get consistent on your terms. We have our credentials worksheet, which starts to address the information exchanges, as well as the assurance levels worksheet. Um, this is one we don't really, you won't necessarily get to. And honestly, our tool is not ready to the point where we're willing to release it, but we can you know, share information. And by the time you reach that point, my hope is that we've already released that because we are releasing these tools openly. So we've covered an awful lot so far. We're only 31 minutes into the presentation. Um, wanted to make sure you're aware that of all of these tools, these ones uh, are, are available. Christine has assembled them. Um, we did have them in a, a somewhat assembled, but the uh, back to the, the Catalyst Fund 10 work, which I think the meeting is starts in the announcement starts in half an hour, um, kind of accelerated was a forcing function for us, which we honestly needed because we've been working with clients on, on, on using these tools, but we wanted to make sure that these are released. So you're gonna get access to all of these. I have not covered all of them. Um, in particular, for example, the value blueprint. This is where you get into value architecture, where are the actual exchanges, where's the dollars made, um, where's the value exchange and the crypto made, however you wanna look at this. Um, but it lets you know, you know, where are the focus points for actual value? 
you'll get access to all of these. We didn't talk about innovation and adoption risk. This is where you have to look at. Well, we'll talk about that in another 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 recording. But you're looking to see what co-innovation and or adoption changes am I asking my partners to make? What's fundamental, and is there a gap, and is there is there just a you know I have to do a massive adoption work and there's no benefit for me? I'm not going to do it. How do you fix that? How do you bring a partner on board and address that? The two that are not available yet are the indemnity and liability worksheet and the assurance levels. Um, they should be available in the next month or so. If you have an urgent need, reach out. You'll understand how to do that uh, uh, shortly. So the the key things behind all of this is we're going to, we've combined in this particular chunk, there's more to the trust continuum than this, but in this particular chunk of work, there's really two big pieces of work that we've combined. One is the platform design toolkit that's available through boundarylist.io. We're going to provide a link to what's called the uh, um, uh, boundary is called the opportunity explorer, which really is a worksheet to let you know, hey, here's how to use those tools where we have dovetailed it with the, the ecosystem governance framework work that comes out of trust over IP foundation. That's where it's, you know, the trust continuum was somewhat unique. Um, we've, we've brought those two together, but those tools, again, the, the, the trust over IP templates are available. Um, they're hard to use, but they're there as a starting point. And we believe that the f templates that we're providing you, um, one, uh, follow along with the two of these things, start you off on a relatively slow, uh, faster progress path. They'll let you know that, you, okay, it's time for you to dig in and do your own. But if you're only doing one ecosystem, you may want to find a partner to work with on that. There are lots of different groups that trust over IP. Um, not many of them are applying this platform design toolkit approach, but um, there's lots of people to talk to about the, about the EGF work there. Platform design toolkit, again, is how do these things start to link together? Uh, they'll let you know how to design your platform. Um, I think Boundary Lace actually wished they had called it the ecosystem a design toolkit, but their, their, their name kind of took off. Um, but really it is about ecosystems and the role that platforms play inside of those ecosystems. So along with working in the decentralized ecosystem design work that we do all the time, this is really what we've learned is that it's this weird interaction of the decentralized ecosystems needs is minimum viable ecosystem concept which comes from Adner's uh, uh, structured ecosystem design. I guess I should have added that in as, as, as a bullet. Um, um, Christine will make a note to, uh, to, to point at that work. It really yeah, is sure. cool. It really is all about uh, uh, getting that uh, ecosystem started, getting that early. So you design it, you deploy it, and then you take a step back and you okay, what do we need to do now to grow it? How do we, and when I say grow, I mean actually really blow it up as opposed to letting it trickle and you know slowly grow. Getting access to these tools is quite easy. We're actually doing really well on time. I'm very, very pleased. Um, email us at tools at continuumloop.com. What you will then get is, the, is access to this toolkit, um, access to uh, the PDFs and the, and the Google Sheets. You can use those as a template, just make a copy of them, uh, put it into your own. Uh, start scribbling on the PDFs themselves. Literally, that's, uh, I used to have, I don't have it anymore. I used to have 11 by 17 printer that would print off in big form. Um, for the Europeans on the call, that's more like an A3, I think, two A4s side by side. Um, these tools are meant to be scribbled on, uh, doodled on, dropped into Miro. Um, if you want, uh, uh, if you do go in deep into the platform design toolkit, they've got their own tooling as with Mural, with Mural as opposed to Miro. Um, those are available to you. We will also point you at the Platform Design Toolkit, Opportunity Explorer, point you at the Ecosystem Governance Framework templates that you can access directly. We have a simple template in the tool set that we're providing as well. But if you want to go deeper, fill your boots, go for it. Trust RIP has that in, in depth. But as well, we're also going to send a short series of emails. So you'll get a, want a copy of this presentation. So you have it in your email so you can quickly reference it as well as a couple of the other videos, and we'll, we'll be releasing more of these. One was particularly on MVEs, going into a little bit more depth. The other is the ecosystem governance framework and how it relates to MVEs, going into a little bit more depth than we just did right now. Those are there to serve as both reminders as well as reference tools. So you can go in and say, what, what, did, what was Daryl rambling on about? 
Okay, this connects to that because when you go through the platform design toolkit, this PDT thing, you will get lost. We've been doing it now four or five years, I think is when we first sponsored the boundary list. I don't think they were called that at the time. Sponsored their toolkit a little bit. It wasn't a huge sponsorship, but it was really cool to see what it has become. Um, you will get wrapped around the axle. You will get confused and that's okay. That's fine being confused. Ecosystems are hard. It's the confusion and working through it and then having those sudden realizations. The tool should help you with that, help you bring some clarity to your ecosystem, which again is you want that minimal viable ecosystem to attract your partners, but also when they come in, they know where they fit. You want to align them because once you've aligned them, they understand where they're gonna drive and create value to where they're not needed so that they can either say, okay, cool, I see an opportunity here, or I don't have to worry about that. Because a lot of these ecosystem players, they fulfill a very discreet role, but they must have those other partners on either side or all around them in order for them to even be effective. So it actually serves as a, as a very interesting way to look at things. Just in, in, in closing here, um, I see we have some chats some questions coming in while well, they've been coming in. But just wanted to close off with a, with a comment that I've been saying for many, many years now, which really is especially applicable for e decentralized ecosystem design, which is control only what you must, influence the rest. Part of the rationale there is you don't have the control you think, but also control is incredibly expensive. Um, I liken it to control is like the, 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 the radius of a circle. You know, it, it seems easy and stuff, but the cost of control is actually the area of the circle. It grows extremely rapidly. The ecosystem governance framework, again, simplify it. Don't try to control that much because, again, that complexity, and complexity is very expensive, gets, gets really, really hard. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and jump into perhaps a couple of questions. Okay, so Peter is asked. the uh, question in our Q&A. Yep, I got one. I'll take yeah. a look at that. So got uh, Peter as an entrepreneurial small dev team, I'm working on a solution. Okay, you think it's a platform that provides educational creds for a university. Are you suggesting I'm a small piece of a larger ecosystem? Um, so I will have partners that are other dev teams who provide VCs for other universities and together we could form an ecosystem providing educational creds. Um, yeah, so there's a really good example, Christine, we should add to the list. Um, to share in that email series, the student reader work that we did. Student yeah. reader was a light application uh, of, of the trust continuum um, where we looked at, okay, what does an ecosystem really need? It was specifically about an earning to learn, but yeah, education is potentially one of the largest ecosystems, um, Pete, that, that it's hard to approach because it is so big. Um, if I go back to the, the concept where I mentioned that, you know, an ecosystem has hundreds of players, an arena is a smaller chunk of that where you want to may want to play where it has tens of players. And then you have really where the jobs is where you really want to get to. Those are the key roles and activities. That ecosystem of education is ginormous. Um, like I look at the, the, the educational institutions that are issuing verifiable credentials for what? Are they issuing them for degrees and diplomas? That's one kind of style of credential. Are they issuing them for individual courses or these mini courses, business schools, uh, you know, B schools are, are issuing one-off courses, one week long executive level course that are intensives, usually have very current material, um, but are extremely relevant. I'm certain most of the B schools right now are running generative, generative AI um, B school one weekers that are really hot for the next two years year, might be six months. Who knows when that trend will die quickly? Who's your customer? Is it the degree diploma, the individual course, the university, a B school? Is it a, a, a state college, a technical college? Is it an internal course at a, at a company? There are so many players here, but yes, you are going to have lots of players. There is no way you can win the issuance part, for example. Um, in my one of my worlds of uh, uh, created systems that were managing uh, critical incident management for you know it was a life critical system, 
One of the competitors, though, we had was Blackboard. Blackboard is an education tool. It's just universities are kind of like small cities, so they have emergencies, so they have incident management systems inside of those tools. The Blackboards and others of the world are going to compete with you live. So you can't win them all. When it comes to verification on the other side of a, of a credentialing system, that may be where more of the value is because why am I asking, hey, new employee, existing employee, um, potential employee, hey, can I see your what, what, you, what you've been working on? What have you done? I'm going to want to see those credentials for various reasons, and I'm likely going to want to pay for that. So those are totally different places. So yes, you're likely going to be um, competing, also collaborating because each of your part, each of your competitors may be a partner in some ways. But my biggest concern on the education space is figure out what arena you're in because the space is so enormous that it's hard to know where you're actually going to add some real, real heavy value. Christine, do we have any questions in on the on the chat side? Yeah, yeah. And Nick has a question here. Um, yeah. She wants to know if you can talk about the tools, how they've helped with some of our engagements um, without naming names. She just wants yep. an idea of use cases um, and how the templates manage complexity. Yeah, so well, one we can talk about openly because we did this in, in the open was, was, was Student Reader. Um, Student Reader had gone already and, and created a, an ecosystem governance framework following the trust over IP template. The, the problem was, and then I just kind of alludes to the question earlier about education. The problem with that ecosystem governance framework initially, the first version was it was a start, which is awesome. It was addressing such a big picture that the story wasn't clear over where people played. Who was in the case of student reader, they wanted to know, um, you know, who's issuing a student credential that says, hi, I'm a registered student. They wanted to know, you know, what are the credentials that are in flight? Okay, well, we had a student credential, we had a course completion credential. Down the road, they may have actual course completion with a mark, which is the difference between a completing a course versus receiving a particular mark because assessing the mark and what that means in the world is wildly different than just completing it. Who was allowed to um, issue those credentials were very, very important. What we did with the templates is, is we went in for a real quick um, ecosystem scan, but then we looked primarily at the arena scan. The arena scan, again, is about um, finding what's called jobs to be done. That's the framework that's applied there. Um, you can learn about that in the platform design toolkit. To get the jobs to be done, this is okay, cool. What are the real roles and real activities that matter here? It turned out there weren't that many. We had, we had issuers of credentials, that had to follow, you know, if, if I'm a issuing a student credential, I had some rules, small number of rules. You know, I have to actually, you know, know that that's really my student. I can't just, you know, make it easy for them to fraudulently do that. Two, that the course provider had to be the issuer of the of the of the actual course completion credential that may or may not be the actual student group. They may be providing the student and then farming out to the ecosystem to someone who's running the course and and, and made checking that it was completed. But those two have to link together. How did we link those? So the tools that helped there were the arena scan um, was a, a, a very big one. Definitely the glossary, just getting into consistent terminology, but also uh, the resources and capabilities as well, because we realized um, when you had a, a school, it was a school, the, 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 the formal group is called the Power Learning Program. Um, it's run by, a, it's, it's run, I think in, in Kenya by a Danian Labs. Um, it's an informal school, but they're running a real course. In this case, related to Fun 10, they're actually running the AP 101, the Atala Prism 101 course, getting a completion, but Atala runs that. So you have a student over here, you have a group running it. So the roles and activities worksheet really, really helped there. We did draw out the ecosystem. Again, we'll put that in, the, in, the, uh, in that email that you'll get with the, here's the student reader thing. You'll see where the tools are at live um, applied. Um, Andy's asked a more simple question to answer. Uh, will we get these? Yes, anybody who's registered and got in will get a copy and will be put on that same list. So you'll get, um, you don't need to re-register again at, at tools at continuumloop.com. Oh, another message. Cool, Andy just said, thank you. Cool, 
Well, um, folks, we have another 13 minutes until the Fund 10 announcement. Um, if you have any questions, let's you know give it one more minute to punch in any questions uh, in through either chat and or uh, the Q&A feature. Otherwise, we can move on and prepare to find out what's going on with this Fund 10. Um, and again, as, if you're coming up with a question, I'll just ramble a tiny bit. Um, it was interesting that this was kind of a forcing function for us. Um, we didn't realize, one, I'm really pleased to see that Catalyst 1 is back. Two, they're back big. Um, it's great to see, and I'm really excited. I did not, I had not been paying enough attention. Um, I didn't realize that the ecosystem approach, that ecosystem launch approach that the Atala Prism team uh, put forward would get such, such legs um, and, and be such a big part. Um, and I'm really excited because I do really believe that these are absolutely critical. Okay, so Greg has asked, wondering about profiles and portfolios, where do they fit into the EGF? The previous question led me to ask, in light of your answer, what is the arena of education? Um, profiles and portfolios, I'm not, if, if we're talking like portfolio management, um, to me, the, 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 the number one piece on this, I'm going to take sort of a product management, portfolio management view uh, of, of this, Greg, and please let me know if, uh, in chat if I'm going off on a tangent because I'm not quite certain. Okay, digital identity goes to user ID. I'm still losing you, you Greg, on, on this. Um, maybe, well, maybe you're talking about education portfolio, sort of the, the learner's portfolio of, hey, I took a course with you know, Rotman School of Business uh, on generative AI, and I did a LLM uh, project. It was a joint project with Harvard and MIT, which creates a, an education portfolio. Perhaps, Greg, that's what you're talking about. Um, that comes into the, yeah, the arena of education is so enormous that one of the groups that we advise, for example, is Learning Economy Foundation, which is really about earn to learn, learn to earn. Um, that's a domain that's enormous unto itself. So the question for arenas comes down to where are we playing? Um, because it's really hard to know exactly what we want. But if I look at learn to earn and I have a portfolio of information that says I need to hire somebody who is, you know, clearly uh, one, an executive level person who is savvy in where generated AI can apply to my business. I may want to say, hey, there's two things I'm looking for. I want to see you've actually done a generative AI and business course from one of these schools. I want to see this. If you have both in your portfolio, you could present that. You're the one holding that information. And if the ecosystem allows me to say, this is arbitrary. Student Reader was not aimed at the B school, the business school world. Perhaps it could have been. Um, the B schools may want to look at an ecosystem that does exactly this because they do tend to collaborate together. But this says, hey, here's your B school portfolio. You took a course from these two different programs, but you can combine those easily and people are actively looking for it. I'm hoping that um, helps answer your question, Greg. You're most welcome. Any other questions or comments? Give it about uh, a minute and then we will drop off and uh, I will have a chance to grab a bite to eat. It's been a very busy morning. Oh, I have a Greg. Did you still want to talk? I just noticed I didn't. I never seen the uh, the hand up thing before. Ah, is that is it possible now? Yep, it's working now. You're live. Yeah, that was wonderful. I just looked at uh, the images that you had there, and in the uh, key components, I wondered where some of these fit. I didn't see wallets as well, but you'd mentioned some of that yep. in terms of tokens and. Um, I really like how it's organized. I just yep. obviously uh, interested sort of in, in a little bit more depth, but um, yeah, yeah. So, so if we go through, um, I'm trying to remember if we did a resource capability analysis of student reader, but we, we've done multiple client projects where, in the resources and capabilities, things like wallets, and both crypto wallets and identity wallets treated separately are required components. What we've never seen is where that is the differentiator. They're required, absolutely 100% required, and you need to define, you know, what does that mean? But for someone to say, I need to own and be the, you know, the one wall to rule them all has not happened yet. 
and I don't know that it will. But yeah, definitely in the resources and capabilities, because if I look at the key roles and key activities and key components in the system, we may want to say, you know, hey, you're going to need an identity wallet, but we don't want to, or we do want to lock down what that exactly means early on. Wallets is an area where I wouldn't want to lock it down early on because I want to understand the business of the ecosystem first before we say, okay, here are the actual four things we need from a wallet. Um, and here's how we codify it. Does that help, Greg? Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm looking forward to just to seeing them and the other ones that we didn't look at today, but uh, really appreciate the, the presentation here in the series. Awesome. Well, you're most welcome. Anybody else? If not, I'm going to slow roll a, a thank you and uh, good luck folks in, 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 in fund 10. I'm hoping this helps. Um, just uh, we are working with two projects as supporting them that we've been working with for some time that, that are uh, aiming at that. So we're not looking terribly hard at, at generating new business. That said, we believe the tools we're pushing for. This is, we're, for anyone watching this recording, that's this is all fun 10 stuff. Um, the tools should help you. We're around if you want to just jump on quick calls. Christine is probably the best person to contact. She can arrange for, you know, helping you point out a few things, reach out to me if, if, if it's necessary. But the tools should hopefully help you get the idea of where those ecosystem governance frameworks can really help you launch that, that, that ecosystem approach. I don't see any further questions. So thank you very much, folks. Everyone keep being awesome. And uh, well, we'll see you all around. Talk to you Thanks, later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.